Okay, great. I am. Um, I'm going to try and uh, speak up uh, a little bit. Um, and uh, as usual, uh, the the meeting for the rest of you is in listen only mode, which means that uh, you will be able to hear me. And the way we will interact, inshallah, is. Uh, with you typing questions in the chat box, and if uh, I will try my best to, uh, you know, to answer them as we go along. So the agenda for today is, uh, you know, we know that in-law relationships can be challenging, and we will explore a little bit about uh, what exactly causes the conflict. And I did a little survey. Um, last week to get a better idea of this, so I'll share the results of that. Uh, we will talk about why it is important to get along. In other words, you know, why are we uh, talking about this? Why is it important to, um, you know, to work on that relationship? We will talk about five practices um, or attitudes uh, or actions that uh, we can take on a daily basis uh, to maintain better relationships. We'll talk a little bit about uh, managing daily interactions and uh, setting boundaries because that tends to be, uh, you know, an issue for some people. And then we will talk about managing the truly difficult relationships. And what I mean by truly difficult is, uh, you know, all of us when we're going through challenges in any relationship, obviously we think that it is really difficult. Um, and, you know, once we go through the whole uh hour or so that we are together and we talk about everything else, uh, you know, when we're talking about truly difficult relationships, it is those relationships after we've done all that we can, you know, we've done the practices, we've uh, done what we can on our end, and yet there seems to be no change. So um, uh, it is important to talk about that because obviously there can be situations where uh, things do not improve despite what we do, and uh, you know we'll see what what we can do in those situations. Uh, so let's begin, um, and I like to begin uh, with this ayah from the Quran. Uh, it is in Surah Raz, ayah 21 and 22, where Allah says, "Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim," and those who join that which Allah has bidden to be joined, and have awe of their Lord, and fear the evil reckoning. And Ayah 22 says, and those who are constant, seeking the pleasure of their Lord, and keep up prayer, and spend benevolently out of what we have given them, secretly and openly, and repel evil with good. As for those, they shall have the happy issue of the Lord. Now, we know that Sile Rahmi, you know, talks about uh, the relationship with our blood relatives. So technically, uh, in-law relationships do not come under that, uh, you know, under the relationship of the womb, which is based on blood. However, it is a good idea to um, to ask ourselves, because obviously, you know, when we are in a relationship, and the reason why those people are in our life is because they are connected by blood to our spouse and to our children, right? And uh, what we do as leaders in the family, and I'm talking, I know, mostly to mothers here because I can see that that is uh, mostly the people who have shown up. But, um, you know, what we do with those relationships will have an impact on how our spouses and our children uh, end up relating to these people. And for them, it is definitely a relationship of the womb. So it comes very technically under this ayat, right? And if we truly love the people, uh, you know, who we are in blood, I mean, in a marriage relationship with or our children, then the idea is that also we need to support them in maintaining those relationships rather than we know, um, you know, all of us, uh, some of us are aware of the power and influence we have on our families, and some of us may not be so aware. But the idea is that um, as mothers, as a parent, um, we are extremely influential on uh, the relationship with the greater family. Uh, so, you know, when we reflect on this, uh, the first thing that, you know, just a few things that uh, stand out for me is that it is uh, proactive. In, in other words, it is asking us to join 
and to make the steps to maintain those relationships, right? Uh, it also talks about focus on the self, and what that means to me is that it is driven by principles rather than feelings. So in any relationship, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, a spousal relationship, a parent-child relationship, you know, there can be times when there is conflict and uh, stress in the relationship. And the idea is that if we focus on our principles rather than on the feelings of the moment, which change according to the situation, we will be much better able to do the right thing in the moment and save the relationship rather than um, take it further down a path where it will be difficult to retrieve it from. And also, uh, desires also talks about uh, material generosity in the sense people who give, right? And there is also something which is uh, generosity of spirit. In, a, in other words, being of a generous spirit uh, implies that we are forgiving of people, we are compassionate towards them, we let go little mistakes. So, you know, with that kind of introduction, let's see, um, you know, why is it difficult uh, sometimes to get along with in laws? And I have to say this, that, you know, when I did the survey, it seems that almost half of the people or even more reported that they actually had really good relationships with their uh, with their in-laws, which is something, um, you know, really important to note. So, again, it's not uh, that every in-law relationship is in trouble. You know, the, the at least half of them or more than half of them are doing okay. And, you know, a lot of people said that even though the relationship was okay. You know, there were times when there was a little bit of conflict and they could certainly learn more. So uh, let's explore why it is a little bit difficult sometimes. The first uh, thing is our own expectations. So our happiness depends on, you know, what we expect reality to be compared to what reality is. So, for example, if we get married expecting that we will be treated in a certain way, that, uh, you know, life will be in a certain way, and it doesn't meet our expectations, and we're not aware that, you know, these were just our expectations, it's not our right, it's not the only way to be, then obviously it is going to create uh, some amount of uh, stress for ourselves. Uh, what I'm talking about societal expectations, it means that, you know, the whole idea of the mother-in-law jokes and the daughter-in-law jokes, it's almost as if society expects there to be conflict. And, uh, you know, there may be good reasons for that, but the idea is that if we buy into that whole idea, if we come from families where, um, you know, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law or sister-in-laws have always had a stressful relationship, Unconsciously, we bring that baggage into our current relationships, and obviously, um, we know that what we expect, um, you know, the way we behave with people uh, will reflect that. So, if I'm expecting that my mother in law is going to be highly critical, even if she says something which would be really innocuous, uh, you know, if my idea is that mother in laws are critical, I will react in that way to her. Um, and it will be a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, sometimes what causes issues is uh, loyalty to one's own family. So, you know, what this means is that if we come from a very different family than what we're marrying into, and that is the case actually for most people, that things are different, uh, because even if it's from the same culture, the same religion, uh, each family has their own little family culture, which is uh, which can be very different. And uh, sometimes, you know, we think that just because something is different, it's necessarily uh, less than or inferior to what we have been used to. So that uh, attitude obviously can create uh, some sort of conflict as well. Um, you know, when when we experience something as um, as hurtful, you know, which is, uh, you know, in our closest relationships are where we are most vulnerable. 
and uh, you know when we enter the in-law relationship there are so many expectations from both parts and there is a lot of vulnerability so when those expectations are not met we may feel hurt and instead of acknowledging the hurt to ourselves we may actually <clears throat> excuse me we may um uh, it may show up as conflict in the relationship um also you know some of you who have been with us a few different times may have heard of the concept of the emotional bank account but let's just review it again the emotional bank account is simply uh, the level of trust or emotional closeness that we feel with another person and what happens is when we do things that are meaningful to the other person and we it is like a deposit in the bank account so for example if um, i really like to uh, you know i like to hear verbal validation for example if somebody tells me they appreciate me or that i've done a good job or even if the food was very good or anything like that it would be a deposit in my bank account on the other hand if you know if for example the verbal validation is very important to me and somebody said something which i experienced as criticism and notice i'm always saying i experienced as criticism because again what we experience as criticism may not be what the other person needs right so let's just be clear on that uh if somebody criticizes me it would be uh, like a withdrawal in the bank account and the idea is that each time we interact with someone we are either building the bank account or we are taking away from it and when the bank account is very low for somebody we have what is called emotional baggage now emotional baggage means that every time we see that person we will almost expect them to hurt us and i think uh, you know i'm assuming that people here get what i'm talking about right uh you know let's just take a very uh, quick example of this if i'm meeting a friend for coffee somewhere and she's late um if i have a good emotional bank balance with her if i like her i trust her a relationship is generally good if she is 15 or 20 minutes late i will give her the benefit of the doubt i will make all sorts of excuses for her now if this is a friend or a relation which i have a little bit of issues with which i have some emotional baggage with the same situation would lead me to have more negative feelings for her so if she's late instead of giving her the benefit of the doubt i would be telling myself that she's always taking me for granted she's disrespectful and all of those things so notice that the situation may be exactly the same but how we react to the other person depends not on the situation but our, on our own frame of mind so emotional baggage basically is based on our unmet expectations and history with that person it happens when we bring the past into the present so for example in the in the coffee example you know i will think of all the times in the past that she has let me down and i will bring all the situations into the present and uh, my emotional state will be based on that so every interaction like i said is seen through that lens of the emotional baggage it's based on our interpretation of the situation so it may have very little to do with uh, with all the facts so it could be that she was actually stopped by the police uh, for some reason there was a blockage on the road or um, you know there was an accident on the highway there could be many different things um so what it does is it actually prevents us from seeing clearly which prevents us from being uh, forgiving towards other people it impacts our health for sure because we know negative emotions are a great source of stress and uh, you know emotional uh, disease um within ourselves and obviously it results in agitation and an incomplete relationship uh, what i mean by incomplete relationship is that um, again we would carry this situation then on into the future so what are some of the sources of conflict um and this was the survey that was filled out by more than 150 people and here's what they said so it seems that the biggest a um, source of a negative feeling or conflict is the way i do things 
Um, and again, that's why I keep bringing up the idea of criticism because, um, you know, we ought to talk a little bit more about that, but it seems that that is what caused. And by the way, uh, you know, in most of what we cover today, we will be speaking from the daughter-in-law's point of view, simply because uh, most people who fill the survey uh, tended to be daughter-in-laws. And if there are some mother-in-laws in the uh, audience today, I would really like, uh, you know, I'd like you to say that so that we could also talk a little bit from, uh, you know, from your perspective. Uh, other things that caused conflict were child-rearing practices, in other words, um, doing things differently, you know, having a different uh, set of rules or limitations or what the child is allowed or not allowed to do. Other things uh, was uh, religion or values. Uh, so again, differences in how, and it's not necessarily even difference in religion, it's most often difference in the way religion is practiced. So even people from uh, the same faith background could have issues if they, um, uh, uh, you know, if they disagree on what that means. And, um, you know, something that I thought would be more of a conflict, and it turns out uh, that it is a conflict for just over 10% of the, of the people who responded uh, was access to grandchildren. And uh, this was interesting because uh, access to grandchildren um, is more, I think, from the point of view of the mother-in-law. And since most of the people who served, uh, who filled the survey, were um, daughter-in-laws, that would make sense. That uh, because often uh, parents-in-law don't tend to speak up uh, in, uh, you know, when they uh, feel that they do not have enough access to grandchildren. So that's just my take on it. Uh, other uh, sources of uh, conflict, uh, actually, before we go there, um, what uh, does this list surprise you? Uh, you know, do you think there should be other things on the list which are, uh, you know, which are not mentioned here uh, in terms of uh, causes of conflict? So we we'll just pause here just for a few uh, moments to give everyone a chance to respond to this. Okay, so uh, this is a quiet group. <laughs> Let's uh, see uh, what other things people mentioned. Uh, there was a lack of perceived support. And again, uh, what I mean by perceived support is basically uh, that one person believed that they were not being uh, supported enough. And uh, quite a few people actually mentioned um, uh, and this is again the daughter in law speaking that the conflict was about how much time um, the daughter in law spent with her family. And again, I think in, um, in modern day, when people are much more financially independent, people are living on their own more. And uh, this uh, does tend to be a source of conflict because. Uh, you know, in previous generations, when there was a joint family system and the, there was, uh, you know, everyone lived as an extended family, this was less of an issue because obviously the daughter-in-law was home most of the time. And when she went to see her, uh, her own side of the family, uh, it was an event or an outing or an occasion. And now, obviously, if, if the couple is living on their own, uh, you know, the, the couple is free to spend time however they want. And if, uh, uh, you know, if it is perceived that, uh, you know, there's an unfair allocation of uh, uh, 
uh, of time, then it can create conflict within the family. So why is it important to get rid of it? Um, you know, often when there is conflict, we forget that when, uh, you know, in a great family system, in a close family, it is basically good for us. It takes work, definitely, to build a family like that. It is uh, it's hard work. Sometimes it's sacrifice. It is giving up being right. It is all of those things. But in the end, we need to be very clear that we are doing it for ourselves, uh, for our children, and for our love. When we keep that, uh, you know, uh, very front and center, then the little conflicts and the little issues become much easier to bear. When we start focusing on things like, you know, why should I uh, be the one to give in and why is it always me to give in and no one appreciates me and it's not fair. When we start focusing on this, first of all, it's a very slippery slide because we can take ourselves down into a very negative, uh, you know, uh, the negative self-talk that we do uh, will have a great impact on not only our emotions, but our thoughts, our actions, all of those, right? So when we keep the big picture in mind that it does take work to build a strong family, and when we have built a strong family, which takes many years and much work, it is actually, uh, it leaves rewards not only for ourselves, but for generations to come. Also, uh, you know, there's been a real shift in the thinking about relationships. So in the old days, it was expected that uh, relationships are work. And with the whole idea of, uh, you know, what's in it for me, uh, you know, I must get my needs met. Uh, and by the way, you know, the idea is not that this is a bad thing. Uh, you know, what I want to focus on is that it's not getting us what we want. So if we, uh, you know, think that what's in it for me and why should I do this and this is not fair, we are the ones who are uh, not going to reap the benefits of a good relationship because, again, research shows that one of the strongest predictors of happiness um, and uh, emotional well-being is a strong relationship. So, uh, you know, it's almost a catch-22 that if something is bad, we don't want to work on it because we think that uh, it's not worth it and it's going to make us miserable, whereas actually the opposite is true. If we work at it, it's more likely to make us happy in the long run. You know, when we get into a battle uh, with the family, really it is a battle where there are no winners, uh, no matter who uh, appears to have won that round. Um, you know, it's very easy to take a relationship down a negative spiral. And, you know, the sooner we stop it, the easier it is to get back on track when we keep going down the spiral and when things go more and more out of control, you know, unfortunately, uh, there's so many stories, uh, you know, which I'm aware of in, in families and relationships where no one even knows how it all started. But here they are with no one talking to each other. And, you know, it may be for a generation or two. And uh, obviously that is a situation which is extremely harmful, not only for us in this world, but certainly in the hereafter, because we all know how, um, what a huge sin it is to break off relations with our, uh, with our near and dear ones. So, you know, in a sense, that is not an option uh, if we consider ourselves to be true believers. And the idea that, um, the idea that, you know, they are in-laws and they're not, it really doesn't hold too much water because the idea is that they are, um, they are uh, in, you know, they are related to our spouses and our children. And obviously what we do will have an impact on that relationship. The true victims uh, are everyone and especially our children. So if for no other reason than if we truly want to see our children happy, uh, then we need to work at this, number one. Number two, I think at the minimum, if we cannot, you know, if we've done whatever we believe we can or we just don't want to uh, get off being right, so we just want to be right, and 
we feel that we are in the right and why should we give in? You know, if all of those things are going on and we've chosen, you know, not to engage, really the very, very minimum we can do is not involve our children in it. There are so many situations where um, when a mother-in-law is not getting along with her sister-in-laws, uh, sorry, when a daughter-in-law is not getting along with her sister-in-law or her mother-in-law or brother-in-law, whoever, uh, who she chooses to confide in or to uh, uh, to involve in the situation is her children. And that is really not advisable because it's bad enough if we want to mess up our own relationships and it doesn't really matter who's right, right? We need to at least give the children the option to to find out for themselves if people are like that or to have their own relationships. Because if we stop them, then at some point the resentment is going to come back. And there are so many people who say that, you know, I never had a good relationship with my daddy. I did not have a good relationship with my uh, with my father's sisters because my mother didn't. And I felt a sense of disloyalty or she uh, would get upset if I... Uh, you know, if I went to see them, and these are, you know, grown women who still have those feelings. Uh, so, you know, in a way, we are perpetuating the whole uh, the whole cycle. So, if nothing else, we can at least, uh, you know, at the very minimum, stop it at ourselves. So, what are some of the practices or some of the uh, attitudes and actions that we need? in order to get along. And obviously this can, you know, this applies to many different kinds of relationships, but particularly to involve. So the first thing is uh, self-awareness. And what this means is that we need to recognize that everyone has a different model of the world. So the way we look at things depends on how we were brought up, what we were told when we were children, what kind of love we got, what kind of attention we got, and um, many, many different things. And it is normal for human beings to think that the way I see the world is the right way or the only way. So having self-awareness would be a recognition of this is where I'm coming from and the reason why I believe, for example, that you know, getting ED uh, from loved ones, for example, getting money or presents on ED from loved ones, is the way you show love, is the way you honor ED, is whatever, right? When I encounter, uh, uh, a, you know, people or a family or even one person who does not believe that and who has a different way of interacting, I need to make space for that difference. In other words, you know, recognize that they have their own model of the world. It does not mean that uh, there is only one way to do this. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you're changing your values or that you are um, not authentic to what you believe, but it is actually making space for a different way of thinking in our mind, making space in our mind without making the other person wrong. Um, it is also acknowledging feelings. So in other words, say uh, in my family, you know, birthdays were a big thing. Everyone would make a big deal out of it. They would shower me with attention and presents. And I get married and uh, they don't. So my in-laws don't believe in gifts. They don't believe in, um, you know, in making a big deal. There's no cake, no flowers, whatever, right? And so what I'm not talking about is I'm not talking about positive thinking. You know? So if you're feeling really let down, you're feeling sad, unloved, you know, you don't feel like you, uh, you know, whatever you're feeling. I'm not saying just ignore that and put on a happy face and, you know, get on with your day. What we're talking about is acknowledge that I am feeling all those things. So acknowledge that, you know what, I'm feeling really hurt and upset. And when I acknowledge that, I'm actually having some kind of self-compassion for myself. So I'm not making myself wrong for having those feelings because feelings are feelings. It's human, it's, uh, human reactions to 
uh, to when our expectations are not met or when we feel hurt to feel upset. That's okay. And after acknowledging the feeling, acting on choice rather than as a reaction to those feelings. This is, you know, if we get nothing else from today, this would be, you know, worthwhile. So, for example, if I'm feeling hurt and I'm feeling upset, you know, I can actually be kind to myself, acknowledge that, recognize what's happening for me, cry if I need to, and, you know, behave appropriately with the people around me. That is a hugely different uh, thing than either, uh, you know, distancing yourself or, you know, sulking or being upset or whatever those things, or uh, not acknowledging and ignoring what I'm feeling and pretending it doesn't matter. Because when we do that, what happens is that the little, little things that we ignore and let go under the carpet, they actually build up. And what happens is that after a while, all of that is almost like what I call an emotional volcano. So emotional volcano means that a little thing will happen and I will erupt like a volcano with uh, you know, which will surprise me as well, that where did all this feeling come from for such a little thing? And uh, a lot of times the reason for that is because we have stuck down our feelings, we haven't acknowledged that. So what we're talking about is, you know, honoring your feelings, which is absolutely nothing wrong with feeling sad or upset when something happens which you don't expect to happen. The, the, the problem happens is when we start acting on those feelings. So as long as we keep the feelings and the acting uh, or the behavior separate, there's absolutely no problem. And lastly, uh, you know, just uh, put that meditation on love. In other words, uh, uh, and this is something that um, I used to practice a lot um, and I still do at times. You know, it doesn't come from any, um, any religious uh, like I haven't read it anywhere, but it is based on names of God. So it is certainly, uh, you know, uh, spiritual in that sense. But for example, you know, if I would meet somebody that would trigger me or it would, um, you know, they would, uh, I knew that I was going to meet somebody who, uh, you know, it was going to be a situation that would probably upset me. I would actually, before uh, meeting them, uh, sit down for a few minutes, you know, focus myself, I would uh, use, uh, I would actually um, close my eyes and pray Yavuduzo, which is uh, love, you know, um, uh, the name of God, which means the loving. And I would imagine myself uh, being surrounded by his love and imagine the people who are, uh, you know, setting me at that time, all of us being uh, surrounded uh, by, you know, by the quality of Yavuduzo, by the quality of um, of love. And that really uh, helps a lot because what it is, is actually putting you into a state. Uh, it is grounding you before you encounter something uh, which might be upsetting. Um, another thing, you know, sometimes it gets very petty. So when we get petty, we start nitpicking on little things and to me, that's the opposite of, uh, of spiritual generosity or generosity of spirit. So very often, uh, you know, when I'm feeling like that, I will uh, pray Ya Jawado a lot. I will call on his name of being, uh, you know, the generous one to instill that kind of generosity. And it doesn't have to be material generosity. It could be uh, generosity in the sense of being um, a large of heart with other people not taking things uh, personally and not, uh, you know, not being focused on uh, on little things. Uh, Self-control is the second practice. So again, this means that um, we do need to, in our actions, we need to uh, do exert self-control and live according to our values rather than by triggers. So even when we are triggered, we need to recognize that um, uh, what is bigger than our emotional state at that time and what is bigger than our, um, uh, our trigger is the bigger value of having a strong family. And when we continuously remind ourselves of that, it becomes very easy to see that they are much easier to see the big picture, 
rather than to uh, to get lost in the little things right and self control means to choose kindness um to actually choose kindness so again this is very different than having an attitude of being a victim very often when we are in a negative relationship or when we figure that you know we think that we are being taken for granted or whatever it is we get into this martyr mentality we get into this victim mode which is really not a happy place to be you know it makes us feel disempowered it makes us feel unhappy it is a very negative uh, place to be when we remind ourselves that we're doing this for ourselves you know that even though somebody may be driving us crazy at that time there is something bigger than we are that we are after and then we can choose kindness which means that uh, choosing anything you know is a is a place of power it is a place of choice it is something that makes us feel better about ourselves um and it is the responsibility of the one more highly evolved so many many times when people come to me with relationship issues and uh, honestly most of the time we want to fix the other person and sometimes people do get upset uh, you know when i suggest of things that they can work on and the idea is why do i need to work on that when the other person is wrong and it's all thought like that me included and what we need to remind ourselves at that point is that it is simply the responsibility of the one who is more highly evolved if we are here uh, you know exploring this right now then it is our responsibility it simply you know it's as simple as that and the tech, uh, the third practice is uh, called perspective taking perspective taking means that you actually um, make room for the other person uh, and you actually walk a mile in their shoes in other words you actively try to understand what life would look like from their uh, from their eyes and this is uh, again it's a skill it is something that we can develop over time uh, you know when we have the intention when we can actually stop ourselves in the middle of conflict and uh, you know consciously ask ourselves so i wonder what is going on for that person uh, you know that's something that can really really help us uh, there are many uh, a lot of different practices and meditations that we can do and inshallah you know at some later stage Uh, we will go on uh, we will do those but for now uh, you know this is uh, uh, you know when we uh, when mother in laws are about the relationship uh, you know what is uh, you know what would you like to talk, uh, tell your daughter in law or what is it uh, it's you know it's funny when you talk to mother in laws and daughter in laws you get such a different picture of the same situation right so uh, what your daughter mother in law wants to tell you is first of all that it hurts to be down to what that means is that up to now she has been the number one woman in her son's life and uh, when you came and replaced her um it it hurt you know it is uh, almost and you know usually when women are going through this they have other life changes going on they might be dealing with uh you know the illness or loss of their own spouse there could be a lot of life events going on which make it difficult um for her to be at her best and the relationship is pretty hard for them as well and both of you her and you need time to adjust to each other for the mother and law the fact that you are the mother of the grandchildren is a very threatening thing the reason being that she knows especially in this day and age that if uh, you don't get along uh, with her you have the ability to stop her from seeing her grandkids and uh, there are so many uh, mother in laws not not for the survey but before in my practice and at other places who have um, who feel you know very very sad about the fact that they cannot see their grandchildren enough because they do not have a good relationship with the daughter in law and that is uh, you know what i was saying that even if you don't have a good relationship for whatever reason 
please do your best to uh, to encourage and foster the bond of the children with the grandchildren uh, with the grandparents because honestly it is such a gift the kind of love um, and attention that the grandparents can give your children can only do them good even if they spoil them uh, you know whatever your own uh, issues with that are really uh, it is a very special love and it would be very sad to deprive your children of that. Um, Mother-in-laws often say that uh, daughter-in-laws want it both ways. They want all the support, but they want no advice. <laughs> and, um, you know, so the idea is that they, uh, you know, when they are involved in your life, providing support, whether it's babysitting or uh, financial support or whatever kind of support, you know, meals or anything, and yet uh, their advice is not welcome. You can obviously feel very hurtful. Appreciation would be nice. So in other words, and this we'll talk a lot more about in a bit, but basically, you know, the way to change any relationship the quickest is to start appreciation. Um, uh, the last thing I have on the slide is uh, when mother-in-law say that, you know what, that they have a lot of uh, life experience. They may have raised many children. They have bought and sold houses. They have set up houses. They have, uh, you know, dealt with the community, maintained relationships. So it would be really awesome if their advice was actually sought rather than rejected. You know, it doesn't mean if somebody is giving you advice or if you listen to someone that you have to do exactly what they say. But actually asking somebody for advice is one of the most uh, loving things that you can do for the other, to the other person. It's a real way of showing respect that you, um, you appreciate their wisdom. So um, what does your daughter-in-law want, uh, want to tell you? I don't know if there are any mother-in-laws here. But, um, and by the way, uh, for the daughter-in-laws here, if there are other things, then you know, please add them. Uh, what your daughter-in-law wants to tell you is that your opinion matters a lot. So when you say something which is experienced as criticism, it really makes a big difference. Uh, daughter-in-laws often fear that they will not measure up. Uh, that they're not good enough or that the mother-in-law thinks that they're not good enough. Uh, all women want to be number one in, in the guy's life. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. And instead of making it an issue, we can actually, if we deal with it in a little bit, with a little bit of humor in the sense of accepting that, you know what, this is it. It's human to want to be number one, just as it's human like for his mother, that he will always be you know, her child, then it makes it less uh, conflictual and you can actually bond over this rather than make it a big issue. Uh, often um, daughter-in-laws will say that, you know, they recognize that the mother-in-law had it really hard and, uh, you know, that they are now taking it out on them because, you know, we did this, so why can't you kind of mentality. Um, and, of course, we say that, you know, things are different now. Obviously, uh, you know, the financial piece is a big one in the sense that people don't need their families in the same way for financial support as they used to. And that's why um, it's a matter of choice rather than uh, obligation that uh, people are together, which I think can actually be a really good thing if you if you choose to strengthen your family by choice, this actually can be a very, very uh, healthy family. And lastly, that I need your love and acceptance. Um, you know, so um, that's from the daughter-in-law's point of view. And the fourth practice uh, is appreciation. And I call appreciation the magic formula because it actually has the, it has the potential to change um, any relationship for the better. And this, you know, we can all try. It doesn't take very much. So if any relationship is struggling, what happens is that we become tunnel vision. We start focusing only on the negative aspects of that relationship. And if we do nothing else except just expand our tunnel vision a little bit to take in the full picture or to take in more of the picture, what we recognize is that it, um, 
there is actually more to it than just negative, and there are actually many things which are positive. Um, and the idea that people do have personal challenges, but everyone also has strengths. So when we choose our focus and when we direct our attention to that which is right, that tends to grow. You know, that's just the law of how things work. When we focus on the negative, we will get more of the negative. And when we're focusing on people's strengths and appreciating them, something really magical happens. So I do invite you to really try this. If you, um, you know, and, uh, you know, when I'm working with couples, I actually give them the homework of, you know, noticing and appreciating at least three to five things about the other person uh, during your day. And, you know, what people know, a lot of them actually stop coming for therapy because they find it works so well. You know, just that one little thing of, um, of uh, focusing your attention on things that are going right and voicing them really does have a, almost like a magical quality on the relationship. And the last uh, practice is, of course, forbearance and forgiveness. Uh, forbearance means that you don't take offense in the first place. Uh, you, you know, you give the other person the benefit of the doubt and you, um, you basically make, uh, uh, yeah, give them the benefit of the doubt, make excuses for their behavior, and forgiveness means that if you do take offense, you learn to let it go uh, sooner rather than later. And inshallah, at some point, we will talk a lot more about what forgiveness is. But for now, let's, um, you know, let's just leave it at that. Now, let's talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day interaction. Uh, so there is something called the exposure effect, which means that, and this, by the way, is based on research on, like, fashion and the things that we tend to see often, we tend to like more. So, um, you know, when we uh, when we tend to see family uh, less often, it will actually create more conflict because there is a lot of, uh, you know, but when we see each other on a regular basis and we have a generally healthy relationship, we have more opportunities to build that uh, emotional bank account. Uh, act the way you want to feel. So what this means is that if you want to feel good, then act optimistic, act positive. This is the same thing, you know, we, I was talking about uh, when we were talking about the meditations on love in the sense that you, uh, uh, you actually get it yourself, you access Allah's names of mercy, of forgiveness, of generosity, of love, um, and, you know, act as if you already have those qualities. And uh, what research shows is that when you do that, you actually begin to inculcate those feelings within yourself as well. Avoid bickering about pointless issues. So there is no way to convince somebody who comes from a different school of thought that, you know what, vegetarian food is better than meat, or meat is better than vegetarian, or fish is better than chicken, <laughs> or about religion, or about politics. Uh, you know, these are uh, things that people tend to argue about a lot, and um, there's really no way of convincing anyone, so why, uh, you know, why engage in those discussions? Um, act according to your own values, accept yourself, and others will accept you too. So in other words, you know, when we show, and this is, you know, even in child rearing, for example, if I'm very clear that... Um, I want to encourage the healthy eating in my children, and that's very important to me. Um, you know, when I focus on my own values rather than people make fun of me that, you know, you're such a health mat or what's going to happen if they don't, whatever, um, if I accept that this is important to me and focus on that, it will be much easier for me to, to deal with the criticism or to deal with the teasing or whatever else may come my way. Um, grant parent privilege. What does this mean? So again, the idea that you know the relationship that your grand uh, that grandparents have with grandchildren is really, really good for the grandchildren. What research shows is that if our mothers were to give us the same advice as our in-laws, we are, would be much more likely to take the advice of our parents rather than our in-laws, even if it is the same advice. 
which is really sad because this just shows that it's really, you know, that we are biased. It's not to do with the advice itself, but it is to do with who's giving it and our relationship with them. So, um, you know, one thing that uh, families often get conflicted about is that uh, grandparents think, for example, it could be the other way around too, but grandparents think that um, mothers are too strict and that they are not allowed to spoil the grandchildren. This, you know, we could have a whole hour just on this, but to put it very briefly, if your child is not living with the grandparents and he is only seeing them occasionally or even uh, regularly, but, you know, not every day, then honestly what they do, whether they give him, you know, six bars of candy or buy him three toys every time he sees them, is really not going to make such a big difference. If, on the other hand, it is, you know, they're babysitting on a regular basis, like they are, you know, they're the time the uh, daycare for your children, for example, or they are seeing them every day for a few hours, then obviously it's a different thing and you need to, uh, to have that conversation with them to explain your point of view. The next point is parent privilege. So again, it is the parent's privilege, not only the privilege, it's actually their duty to bring up children um, according to their own values. And uh, so for the big things, uh, you know, the grandparents should recognize that uh, they need to support the parents in order to do that because, you know, being conflicted and not supporting the parents is actually going to be really bad for the child. So even if you disagree with the uh, with how the parents are raising the children, you know, if it's a big value thing or if it's about religion, then obviously you can uh, share your uh, uh, share your ideas. But at the end of the day, it is the responsibility of the parent to uh, to look after the well-being of the child. Uh, we need to be flexible where we can. So you know, a lot of times, and I think this is much more true today of parents, uh, you know, many young parents tend to be very regimented um, in their children's uh, routines and in, uh, you know, even when they go away on holiday, what they eat, when they sleep, how they sleep, what they, you know, all of those things. And again, the idea is that we need to recognize that all of those things are really a way to manage our own anxiety and really it has nothing to do with how the child does. Your line is now unmuted. To mute yourself, use the mute button on your phone. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, so I was talking about the uh, parent privilege and how it is the parent's duty uh, to bring up uh, children in their, uh, you know, in their way, in, uh, you know, in, in what they believe is right. And, but, you know, in things that don't matter that much in terms of, you know, bedtimes and what they eat and uh, things which, you know, if it's a question between doing that and being a little bit flexible so that they can have a relationship with their grandparents, the relationship with their grandparents is really going to be uh, doing them a lot more benefit, for example. Uh, if, so, so if they have to stay uh, a week later to 10.30 rather than go to bed at 8 because that's their routine, 
but going to bed later and seeing their grandparents, so attending a cousin's wedding or going to a cousin's house is going to give them a lot more benefit in the long run. So um, again, the idea that you know we need to be a little bit more flexible. Uh, the big picture, so again, think of the link that you love. The link that you have with your in-laws is your spouse and your children. So if for nothing else, we need to focus on that in order to make the relationship better. Um, and lastly, again, to focus on the positive. In other words, uh, you know, when we get upset, it becomes a tunnel vision. And when we, um, when we get... Uh, you know, when we intentionally recognize that, you know what, I'm only focusing on the negative and I need to expand my focus a little bit to also acknowledge all the positives that's happening, it, uh, it's a good way to get the relationship back on track. So, um, you know, even in the daily interactions, there are times when we do need to set boundaries. And if we do that in a way that acknowledges that the other person really is trying to help, that they're coming from a good place, and that you appreciate the love that's behind the action, it can really help. So saying things like, I know you're trying to help. I appreciate what you're doing. I'm really glad that Ali has loving grandparents. A simple thing like, thank you, um, uh, you know, um, really does help uh, acknowledge that even if you disagree or you're making a different choice than what you're telling them, it doesn't mean that you do not appreciate uh, the rest of what they bring into the relationship. If you actually make an effort to uh, just to focus on the appreciation, it can have a huge impact on the relationship. Uh, often, you know, I find the, the daughter-in-laws who have the best relationships with the in-laws are those who who actively befriend their in-laws by asking them their help and support in dealing with their with their uh, with their child, and uh, even asking their advice on you know on uh, parenting. Even if you don't uh, you know you don't have to necessarily accept everything, but if you make them feel that they have something to contribute, it makes a huge difference. So asking them, you know, what was about like as, as a child, uh, you know, what did he like, was he naughty, you know, that can really make them a part of your, uh, you know, they can make them feel that you're on the same side rather than uh, on the opposite side, which is actually unfortunately what happens uh, when the relationships go sour. In terms of parenting, um, you know what I'm talking about, getting the big guns of research out. What that means is, so for example, if you are trying to limit sugar with your child and your in-laws insist on giving him, you know, 15 bars of candy or whatever, it's a good idea to, you know, bring uh, an article which actually talks about the evils of sugar, for example, and discuss it with them and say, you know, this is uh, new things which, you know, didn't, we didn't know this when you know when we were young, and I know you're trying to, uh, you know. Uh, but how about we come up with different ways of, uh, you know, different treats that are a little bit more healthy or whatever. Again, the idea is that instead of uh, negatively um, inter interpreting everything that they do, if you actually have a communication about it, it can be extremely helpful. Now, the last uh, bit is about dealing with difficult people. What this means is that even after you've done everything and you are still, um, um, you know, uh, you know, we've tried all this, so how do we deal with people who are truly difficult? The first thing is to be proactive. In other words, um, I love this ayat from uh, the Quran where it says, Bismillah rahman rahim and not alike are the good and the evil, Repel evil with what is best. So the idea is that you do not do like for like, but even if somebody is, um, you know, behaving in a certain way with you, you actually, again, stay true to your values and you act from your values and uh, you do the best, uh, you know. And then what happens, Allah says, is that he between whom you was enmity would become as if they were a warm friend. 
So this means that you respond instead of react. Reacting means that there's a trigger and you do automatic uh, response, right? Uh, react, that's what reacting is. Responding means you actually think about your values, you think about what's the best thing in the situation, and you act from that. Um, so again, being proactive, uh, we talked a lot about the power of appreciation. Again, this can really be helpful in turning relationships around. Speaking up. Um, so all of this uh, may not work, and there may be times where you actually need to speak up. When you are going to speak up for something that you know might cause uh, you know, conflict or issues, you have to know your aim. You have to stay focused on the prize. In other words, you need to know that you need to do the best for your relationship uh, while not compromising on major values, right? And when we do that, when we speak like that, it's grounded in empathy and compassion and love and not ego. So without going too much into that, you know, when we check in with ourselves when we want to speak, we will know if it is that we want to set the other person right because it's unfair or whatever. You know, when we are feeling all those things and we know that it's not coming from values, it's coming from ego, it's coming from uh, wanting to be right. So we need to communicate for ourselves and not to change others. In other words, uh, if something's not working for me, I need to be very clear that the reason I'm speaking up is not that it's right or wrong, but just because simply not working for me. So for example, if the children are going to, you know, if the children are staying with grandparents and they're going to bed every day at midnight and their school life is suffering, then you need to be upfront and say that it's not working for me because I have to deal with not only, you know, the school issues, but there's the site that they're trying to the next day and, you know, I need to, uh, I need support on this. Um, Speaking up, uh, healthy assertiveness, uh, you know, this is literally on a formula that when X happens, I feel Y because I need Z. So when the children go to uh, bed late, I uh, feel frustrated because um, I need them to focus on school and I need sleep myself or whatever, right? Um, so again, you're focusing on yourself rather than blaming the other, and you're owning the problem. You're saying that this is my issue. It's not, you know, you're, it's not what you are doing. It is what I need. It's a very different way of of giving up concern. Um, so again, when we take the high road, what happens is that we are focusing on ourselves, which we have control over. So we're not wasting energy on on blaming someone, on doing, you know, on making the other person wrong, but we actually um, are living, you know, we can sleep with ourselves, we have a clear conscious, we have high self-esteem, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we can tell ourselves that we've done our best. So if you've done all this and nothing changes, you know, when you're actually dealing with a troublemaker, then what? Uh, unfortunately, there are times when this happens, and, uh, you know, this I only put in actually uh, in, in a workshop when, you know, I was uh, talking to people and they did come up with situations where, uh, you know, there was actually a, a situation about none of this worked. In those situations, you need to minimize damage. What this means is that you protect your nuclear family through clear communication. So you need to have a conversation, um, again, trying not to make the other person wrong, but um, making sure that all of you are clear on what the communication is amongst yourselves. Uh, you need to find ways of maintaining the relationship because, again, unfortunately, there is no out for us in maintaining uh, blood relationships. We are never given the permission to give up, uh, so we still need to uh, to find a way that we can maintain at least minimum interaction, and we can do that by grounding ourselves. So before we're going to meet uh, that person, we actually focus on ourselves, do the meditation, um, you know, even practice what we're going to say so that we're not triggered. Uh, we could meet in groups um, rather than one-on-one -on -one because, you know, when you're in a large group, it forces people to be on good behavior. They're less likely to, to make trouble. Uh, taking the first step, so often, you know, what I recommend to people who say that, you know what, I'm going to get that phone call and it's going to be like this. So I said instead of 
focusing, getting so stressed, waiting for that phone call, why don't you make the phone call? And that way you will have the home ground advantage. In other ways, uh, in other words, you will be talking when you are prepared, when you have prepared what to say, and it will end the, the stress and the anxiety if nothing else. And again, I go back yet again to appreciation because when you appreciate somebody who is making trouble for you, it can be extremely disarming. And I'm not talking about uh, appreciating things which are not true or making it up, but again, uh, you know, expanding your focus to find something that you uh, like or uh, dislike less, for example, about that person. And, uh, you know, most of that, whether it might even be what they're wearing or how they cook or how they clean, or it could be any number of things. But when you start appreciating somebody, it actually changes hearts and it softens, uh, softens hearts, right? So sorry I went through the last bit a bit fast, but um, you will have the recording to uh, go over it uh, if you need to. And I will uh, stay on for just a few minutes more to see if there were um, any questions. And of course, you could always uh, contact me via uh, the website or um, you know, through Facebook as well. So thank you so much, and uh, salam